All right, I'm gonna share with you some information on how I built this. Jim, this one's for you, buddy. And other viewers just like Jim may be wondering um, some of the dimensions and uh, just some of the specifications on what I did to build this. So if you're not interested in something like that, uh, this video is probably not for you, but for some of you home fabricators that wanna build something similar and uh, have the right equipment, and uh, you know you can save yourself some money by doing that um, simply because these run you know anywhere probably from anywhere from 12 to maybe 1800 if you were to buy one and you can build it for a fraction of that price the other thing i want to share with you is some of the mistakes that i made in building this um, it didn't turn out perfect obviously the first time uh, one of the things that i had to do is rebuild the splitting wedge and so I'll show you my old one and compare that to the new one and why I rebuilt it. But if you didn't get to see the first video of me actually using it, um, there will be a little tag up here. And uh, you can click on that to watch it if you'd like. But uh, this is more specific to those that want to build one. So another quick tip, um, if you are going to build one, um, I had mentioned that I got this 6x6 six six I-beam at uh, my local steel shop. Now, I don't know, steel prices can vary literally just based on time of year and availability, and uh, they can also vary by location. But um, I'll tell you what, if your steel shop is producing a lot of metal and <clears throat> cutting some parts or cutting some specific dimensions for people, you're gonna get a lot of scrap pieces. And so uh, what I learned is that these I-beams, they sit around the shop for a very long time. So um, in my instance, I was able to get a discount on it uh, because they're trying to move the inventory of scrap pieces. So I think I got it pretty much for cost or maybe a little above cost. But uh, six by six I-beam made of three eighths thick steel um, cost me about $74, I believe it was. Um, and this is a 39 inch piece. Um, I really wasn't concerned about the length necessarily because I can adjust for that in my brackets and stuff. So I just took that piece. Everything else on this is primarily made of 3 8 inch steel, so I was able to buy just 3 8 plate. Uh, it's just mild steel, it's nothing heavy like AR400 or anything uh, with more carbon in it. It's just the uh, mild steel. But most of this is 3 8 um, These brackets right here are 3 16 I wanted to make them out of quarter inch, but I didn't have enough. So I made them out of 3 16 If I could do this over again, um, I might use a quarter inch. Um, not that they're bad or there's, there's no structural um, uh, integrity compromised uh, due to it, but just peace of mind for me, I'd like to use quarter. But I went with 3 16 and it worked just fine. So you could uh, do these brackets out of 3 16 if you wanted to. A little bit about the hydraulic. Um, in the video where I was building this, I had a four inch hydraulic cylinder and a three inch hydraulic cylinder. This is the three inch one. I had tested it earlier, it worked great. I tested the four inch one and the, uh, the body, the housing was cracked. So it was rendered basically non-usable. So I went with this three inch cylinder and this cylinder is an eight inch stroke. So the retracted length is uh, 20 and a quarter inches and the, uh, I guess, extracted or expanded uh, length is 28 and a quarter inches. So what I did basically was I wanted to make sure that the distance from the tip of the cutting wedge was um, 18 inches. And so that's what this is. And so when you build yours, um, you kind of want to keep in mind uh, the stroke length to how deep it will go into the piece of wood um, in order to split it. So this has got a limited length of only eight inches. So I needed to get it, you know, down far enough such that it would, um, it would make the split okay. So I designed mine to split an 18 inch piece of wood. If you have anything longer, it just physically won't fit. So a couple other things that you're gonna wanna know about uh, the hydraulic cylinder is the diameter of the pin that goes through uh, the top and bottom. So most of them are one inch. Um, you get into the larger cylinders, they can be um, a larger diameter. But in this case, they're, they're both one inch, both the top and the bottom. So what's nice is that you can buy pins at um, any farm implement store, um, like top link pins, and those are also one inch. 
So it just works out perfectly that that's what I used here. And then um, you can come up with another pin on the bottom. Some hydraulic cylinders actually come with pins, but they're one inch and that's a very common size. So you should be able to find uh, pins relatively easy. Okay, so these brackets um, I designed on, I use a program called Fusion 360 and then I cut them out on my CNC plasma table. Now, most of you obviously probably don't have something like that, but you don't have to make them, you know, nice rounded corners or anything. You basically just got to make a bracket um, so that the top pin fits in there. Now, what I should mention though, and something that you might want to consider is making sure that the hydraulic cylinder stays parallel with the body of the uh, I-beam or whatever material you're using. And the reason for that is so when the hydraulic cylinder extends and then retracts that it doesn't tilt, it doesn't make the, um, the splitting wedge tilt either way because then it's going to dig in and you might bend um, a piece of metal. And I'm going to show you an example of that and that's part of the reason why I had to rebuild the splitting wedge is because the uh, the angle of the um, hydraulic cylinder was not parallel uh, it was a little bit a few degrees off and uh, therefore it actually bent this base plate because it was pushing and pulling at an angle and uh, that that plate didn't like it so um, I would recommend making sure, and it's really going to depend on when you make these mounts to make sure you're compensating for the thickness and centeredness of this hydraulic cylinder to go straight to the pin. And then you also want to take in the thickness or the distance from where it will mount to the splitting wedge back to uh, the substrate of the, um, of the beam or whatever material you're going to use. And part of that then is you want to consider the thickness of this plate. So in this instance, it's 3 8 So I had to make sure I compensated for that as well. So that's just some tips on when you mount that to make sure that it's um, parallel or pretty, pretty close to parallel. It doesn't have to be exactly perfect. Um, but it will make a difference in the longevity uh, or survivorship of um, your splitting wedge. Now I also want to mention that uh, these basically, so this plate, uh, 3 8 plate is 2 inches wider than the base of uh, the I-beam. So the I-beam is 6 inches wide, so I made this plate uh, 8 inches wide to give me an inch of room to uh, create a sliding mechanism um, on this side. So, <clears throat> so it's 8 inches wide and all of these are 3 8 and I would recommend sticking with 3 8 I, I wouldn't go quarter because the first piece of quarter inch that I used um, ended up bending. So um, you can 3 8 3 8 and 3 8 um, You could put a uh, maybe a washer in here to give it a little bit of room but that will also add to how it um, pushes and pulls. So you want to be uh, conscious of that. And then, um, so anyway, 3 8 3 8 3 8 that ends up being 9 8 or an inch and an eighth. That's how long this piece is. So when you get hardware, um, I would recommend these are grade 5 bolts. Um, grade 2 is probably too soft. So I'd recommend either grade 5 or grade 8. Grade 8 might be a little um, overdone. But if you look at the, uh, the bolt head, I don't know how well you can see that, but there's a line and a line and a line. So if it's got um, three lines in the bolt head, that means it's a grade five bolt. And if it's got, I believe, five lines, uh, that means it's a grade eight bolt. So the higher the grade, the, the, the harder uh, the material of the bolt, so they won't break or bend. Now the lift arms, these uh, lift arms, I made myself and I just had some of this uh, round tubing laying around and it was not perfectly sized but good enough uh, for me you're not pulling anything with this you're basically just letting it rest in here and using it as a, a lift point um, I wouldn't recommend uh, buying bushings for it bushings are so expensive now they used to be kind of affordable but 
Uh, lately, they've really increased in price. So just, just find yourself or go to the steel shop. They'll have scrap pieces of that. And you can, uh, you can get the size that you want. You can even make it fit perfectly in this uh, uh, quick hitch if you wanted to. Uh, but again, it's not, it's not really essential. Um, <clears throat> I added two brackets, one here and one here, just to kind of give it a little extra support over here. This is not intended to be any type of a clevis hitch type of a hook, uh, though you could design yours that way if you wanted to. But um, sometimes I come, I encounter some alignment issues with clevis hitches. Uh, so anyway, I just stuck with uh, the pin style here and just made my own. So I'd recommend you do that if you want to save some money. Oh, I also want to mention the distance from the floor. So if this was resting perfectly flat on the floor uh, to the center of this is 12 inches. Um, you could probably get away with 10 inches if you wanted to and get a little bit more lift height out of it. Uh, but I went with 12 to give myself plenty of room um, so such that as I'm backing up to it, um, I have uh, plenty of distance here uh, to grab a hold of the pin and lift it. So that's 12 inches from the floor uh, to the center of the, of the pin. And then the uh, top pin is about 27. In my case, it's 27 and three quarters from the floor. Um, you could probably get away with uh, 27 because mine's not resting perfectly. It's more so in the center of the hook. Um, but that really doesn't matter too much. Uh, you could adjust it here. Uh, but I never really adjust mine because it's, it's at where all the other implements hook up to. So I'd make that at least... Uh, 27 to 28 inches from the from the floor okay let's talk about uh, the bottom plate this bottom plate is made out of 3-8 steel and um, this dimension is actually 24 wide by 32 long no 30 long I'm sorry 24 wide by 30 inches long and the reason I did that is because I wanted to make sure this area right here was a two by two because I didn't want to lose any space because this is six inches wide. So I, I wanted this to be a two by two. Honestly, it's too big. Um, you don't need to make yours that large. Uh, when you buy one of these, just make it like a two by two if you want. Um, or two foot by two foot. 24 by 30, I think is um, a little too large. If I could redo this again, I'd shave off six inches here and, and just save the, the cost of this plate by doing that. The other thing I'll mention is I've used it a couple times. There's just a slight bend to it. So what I'm gonna do is actually put some uh, box channel under here, some rectangle channel, and then I'm gonna put it uh, the rectangle part horizontally such that I can actually use um, pallet forks in, in in case it's sitting on the ground, I don't have to hook up to it. I could just put the pallet forks on, lift it, and move it around wherever I want to. And that'll add strength to uh, keep it from bending. Um, so I'd recommend you just do that right away. I should have done that right away, and I didn't, but I'm going to add that later. And then um, I'll have to repaint some a little bit because I know the, the heat from the weld will bubble the paint, but that's fine. So Now, if you do do that right away, then you have to compensate for that distance and make your distance from your pins to the floor, you know, that has to be, that has to be factored in. So overall distance, um, so if you were to put something there, the overall distance from the floor to the pin should still be 12 inches. Uh, just know that that dimension would then change. Okay, before we talk about this splitting wedge, let's talk about this one. So this is my first one and uh, Here's why I redid it. Uh, a couple of reasons. I actually had it all hooked up and I tried it. And the main reason I redid it was because this base plate right here bent on me. Um, and that's due to the incorrect angle or being non-parallel with the sub, uh, substrate. And that's why it bent. So that's um, also a quarter inch material. So I'd recommend making out of three eighths. The other reason is um, this mounting bracket to the pin, I cut this on a CNC table, again, one inch pin. The, the length here doesn't really matter, it's really up to you. Um, 
<clears throat> you could make this longer if you want. You don't have to, but um, why I made another one is because this is only one three-eighths wide, and on this one, I actually put two of them together and welded them, and this is a bad weld because it's kind of a butt weld, uh, to close this gap um, between the um, hydraulic shackle or whatever that's called and, uh, and the splitting wedge. So I welded the two of them together to compensate for some of that uh, distance. Now I really should, and I think I will actually make some shims and put some shims in there to, to really tighten that up because the angle, I mean, it still can move side to side, so you don't want it pushing um, to one side or the other uh, either. So I'd recommend getting uh, either a really thick metal here, or if you cut um, a few of them, make sure that they, um, anyway, make sure that this gap is kind of filled up a little bit. So I welded two of them together, and I think that I'm actually gonna add, add some uh, washers or some shims to that as well. So that's another reason why I built another one. And then the third reason uh, is that I made these kind of splitting portions too big. <clears throat> so the dimensions of this whole thing, and it's the same on this one, uh, this is six inches long from tip to here is six inches. Um, I made these, and it's six inches tall, so it's, it's like a perfect square, six inches tall. These portions right here to help split the wood apart, I made these six inches tall or high, and then I made them five inches wide. Um, on these one, or on this one, I made them same six inches tall, but I made them three inches wide, and I would recommend this um, because it allows for more distance right here uh, for the wood to start splitting. This was a little premature. <clears throat> so as the wood would start splitting, it would just kind of bottom out right here and then it wouldn't split the wood. So make sure that you don't make your wedge uh, too long. Uh, make sure it's a little shorter such that it can start splitting the wood, then hit this portion and then spread apart, which that one does a much better job of. Okay, another thing is uh, when you get an I-beam, it doesn't come with like a top cover. So you have to make one um, in order to make this top surface here flat so you can weld um, a bracket to it. So that's just a six inch by six and a quarter because that's the actual dimensions of the six by six. Um, so yep, you just gotta make one of those two. So that's six by six and a quarter. And then finally, let's address the hydraulics, the lines. So I got some uh, comments about uh, why would you do it this way? And the reason is, is I don't have a rear uh, selective, selective control valve, an SCV. Um, I don't have any type of a third function or power beyond uh, remotes that run to the back. So some of you that bought a 1025R and you have um, a backhoe with it, it would already come with a power beyond uh, hookup towards the rear of the tractor. I didn't purchase that. I also didn't install a third or an aftermarket third function. So the most economical way and cost effective way is just to run lines from there and go straight to the, uh, the loader connections. So that's what I did. It's the cheapest, it's the most uh, cost effective and it works. Um, but it's not, you know, I guess it's not the prettiest method. But that's the reasoning for why I went that route. So if you do the same, I would recommend using the two ports, top and bottom, that are closest to the tractor um, because those are your curl functions. And so you can still raise and lower the, the loader. If, theoretically, I had a Power Beyond kit, you can get those from Summit Hydraulics, um, I think for about 150 bucks. It depends on the model year of your 1025R, and they make them for other tractors as well. Um, the difference there though is the Power Beyond kit will come out right about here somewhere, and it's just one port that uh, there's constant pressure going to that uh, port as long as the tractor is running. So you don't have any type of a valve uh, to operate the, the cylinder. So if you got a Power Beyond kit for 150 bucks, 
you would have to add a like a log splitting valve, a control valve that you can buy at TSC or wherever. And that's about another 150 bucks, uh, depending on what, what model you get. But that would be a solution um, to basically not have to set the wood here. And then I have to take uh, a step or two in order to get back to the joystick and operate uh, the hydraulic cylinder. So ergonomically, adding a power beyond and adding that uh, control valve, that would be ergonomically a little better because you don't have to move as much. But it's a price I'm willing to pay just to take a step from here to there and operate it with my uh, valve that is already on the tractor, basically. So again, cost-effective solution, but it does come with, um, I guess, a little consequence in ergonomics uh, if that's the route you decide to go also. Okay, the other thing I wanted to mention is the uh, tonnage of the hydraulic cylinder. Now, if you go to any big box store and you were to buy a log splitter, uh, they're typically rated in tons of force. So it'll say 16 ton uh, splitting power. I've seen some up to like 27 ton splitting power. Um, I was curious also what the splitting power of mine is as well. So you can do this on just about any hydraulic cylinder, I think. Um, it's, it's a simple Google, just Google um, hydraulic cylinder tonnage calculator or force calculator and there's different calculators that'll come up. So this is a three inch bore. Uh, the stroke length doesn't really matter, um, but what does matter is the uh, diameter of the bore and the diameter of the rod. So based on what I can um, measure, this is a three inch bore and the rod diameter is an inch and an eighth. And then what you do is you take those dimensions and then it also factors in your um, hydraulic pressure, uh, whatever your pump is, is the PSI is at. So stock, these come at about 2000, these 1025 Rs. I crank mine up to 2800 um, and I've had no issues with that. Uh, it's just nice to get a little extra lift capacity and such. So if you take 2800 and you use those dimensions and you put it into the calculator, uh, you get a uh, push pressure of 19,792 pounds. And then in order to get tons out of that, you just divide it by 2000, which in this case is uh, 9.89 tons or close to 10. Now that's going to depend on whether your uh, PSI is cranked. So if you're currently at 2000 PSI, the stock pressure, and you use a three inch um, hydraulic cylinder with an inch and an eighth bore, that would be 14,137 pounds of push force. And then if you divide that by 2000, uh, that's about 7.1 ish tons of force. So uh, if you watch my other video on me using this, I think that's plenty of force to split wood. Um, I don't think you need much more. It, it depends on the type of wood, I suppose. You can get away with this type of a, a cylinder. You don't need anything super large, um, but it's up to you. Obviously you can put whatever, whatever size you want. So the larger the diameter of the bore, the slower it will move. Uh, because it takes longer to uh, fill that capacity uh, compared to one that has a smaller diameter bore. So with this bore, this three inch one, I typically run the tractor about half throttle. And if I'm kind of in a rush and I'm just a little impatient, I might go wide open. But at half throttle, um, I'm pretty satisfied with the performance in terms of speed that this um, cylinder is able to cut. So. If I were to use my other four inch cylinder, I'd have uh, more tonnage, I'd have more splitting power, but it would be much slower. So just some tips for you in terms of thinking about what size uh, of a cylinder you want. All right, lastly, let's talk about cost. How much did this cost to make? Um, my estimation, because I, I had some of the material here at my own shop, this I had at my own shop, um, some of the other smaller 3 8 pieces, um, I had laying around. But overall, from what I reasonably estimate, it cost me uh, $420 to build this myself. 
Um, now I had the paint also laying around because I bought that like two years ago. I don't even remember how much I paid for it. But I have the cutting um, and the welding material. I had, you know, I have the welder. I have the CNC plasma table. Now you may have to either pay someone to cut those parts for you, and I don't know what their charge will be. Uh, but you could add that on. You may have access to materials at a cheaper price than I do. Um, so it just depends. If you don't want to hire someone to cut these parts for you, and you decide to cut your own, you know, you're going to have to buy the uh, the cutting discs for maybe a. Uh, die grinder or um, angle grinder or something so your costs are going to vary but um, you know factor in maybe anywhere from four to five hundred dollars if you have uh, some of the equipment such as a welder um, already on hand however uh, it's still worth the money to me it was definitely worth the savings because it's anywhere from you know half to you know a quarter of the price depending on what you're looking for um, there's no shipping involved. You have a lot of fun building it. You get to use your mind. You're going to make some mistakes along the way, obviously, but it's kind of fun to figure that out and correct it and just, just, you know, be prideful in something that you built. So, uh, that's how much it cost for me. Your price might be a little bit different, but, um, boy, I tell you, it was a lot of fun making it. Well, Jim, and some of you other viewers that were interested in this information, I hope it's helpful. I know it's kind of long. Hey, if I missed anything, please put them in the comments below. I'll try to be responsive and then let's help each other out as a community to answer questions because I'm not an expert in fabrication. I'm not an expert in hydraulics or any of those types of things, but I have a general knowledge that I'm willing to share. And uh, if any of you are experts, um, I hope you're willing to share your expertise with, with us in the tractor community. So we're just out here trying to have fun, trying to build some stuff, trying to save money. And so if you can contribute to that, um, all of us are thankful. So, hey, thanks for tuning in and uh, we'll see you next time.